Well, I've been having a good time here this week, and I hope you have as well. It's been a real blessing for me to be with Bob and Ann Nelson and Myrne and Sue Harris. And I've noticed that one of the customs here is that everybody has a suggestion for the president. And so uh, I want to be part of the custom, and uh, I have just one suggestion. Next year, when he's booking the dates for the camp, he should reject the invitation of the in International Convention of Mosquitoes to have its meeting here the same week. <laughs> I'm sure being a man of great power, he'll be able to arrange that without too much difficulty. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, please, to what is the most famous portion of the Scripture, the pollsters tell us, Luke chapter 15. I'm not going to read it because it is so famous. It is the story of the prodigal father. We normally call it the prodigal son, but prodigal means to give everything away. And the one who's really prodigal in this story is the prodigal father. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can hide ourselves in you. Thank you that we can run into your open arms and be enfolded there. And from that place can go forward in confidence and cleanness and power to confront the evil in this world. We are here these days to be enfolded again in your arms, not so that we can stay here in some flight from reality, but in order that we may be prepared to be reality and to face reality in our lives in the coming days. Help us again as we sit at the feet of the Holy Spirit that His Word and His truth might be applied to our hearts for the good of the world. In your name we pray, amen. A young man came into my office at the seminary one day and he said, I, I want to talk with you about my grades. And I thought, oh, okay, yes, I've had this conversation before. And I said, oh, is there a problem with them? He said, yes, you gave me too high a grade. I thought, oh. Well, now, I've not had that conversation very often before, but then as I thought about it, my heart sank, and I said, why? I thought he was going to tell me he had cheated on an exam. He said, well, I really don't know the material that well. I said, really? You wrote some of the best exam papers that I've seen in recent years. I think you know the material very well. But he said, you don't understand. There, there's so much more that I need to know. I don't deserve an A. And I said, tell me about yourself. And he began to tell me. His mother, who was a straight A student in high school, had become pregnant with him when she was not married. And as a result... She had married the father and given up long cherished dreams of going to college and stayed home to raise this little boy. And as he described his growing up years, I understood. He was going to fulfill all of those destroyed dreams. And he could never do anything well enough. The best was always not good enough. And he said one day in the second grade, he didn't turn in a paper and got a zero for the day. And he didn't tell his mother. I wouldn't have told her either. But his mother found out. And he came home for lunch from school one day and his mother was making his lunch and he could tell she was seething about something and finally it all came out. 
She called him a failure. She called him a liar. She called him a cheat. And the more she talked, the more angry she became. And finally, she took a butcher knife and stabbed the peanut butter sandwich that she was making into a mush. She said, this is you. And scraped it onto the floor and held his face in it and said, eat it like a dog. That's the way dogs eat. I understood it all. No matter what he did, inside that little boy's heart was a mother's voice saying, you never do anything right. You never. No matter how good you do, it's not good enough. I was speaking in a conference in California. And I, I know you forget this, but speakers do see you. Some of you are adjusting your faces right now. Uh, and I saw a beautiful woman about two-thirds of the way back in the congregation. She was tall and willowy, gorgeous red hair. She was beautifully dressed. I could see from a distance she had a very attractive figure. And later in the week, we were talking, and she began to tell me about her recurring depression and also about a recurring dream. She was climbing up a cliff, just fearful for her life, just immense depths below her. And just as she got to the top and felt a sense of relief, her father's face would appear and he would pry her fingers loose and she would fall. She told how, how ugly she felt. She had been, as a teenager, as beautiful women sometimes are, tall and gawky, couldn't ever seem to really look very graceful. She was always falling over things and her father regularly told her, And I said to her, but, but you are so beautiful. She looked at me, and the only word I can think of is pityingly, and said, can you imagine what it is like every morning of my life to look into the mirror and see that beautiful face and know that that is only a veneer covering immense ugliness. In his case, the inner voice said you're dumb and the inner voice was more to be believed than the facts that the young man was brilliant. And in her case, the inner voice said you're ugly and graceless. And that was more to be believed than the facts that said she was beautiful and graceful. And friends, in my experience, those two experiences are much more the norm for us than we might believe. In all my travels, I think I've only met two or three people who really honestly believed they were superior to all the rest of us. And I have met Thousands of people who might have been pretending superiority, but it was to cover a deep abiding conviction that they were not worth very much. Now, what are the results? Well, a person who sees themselves as valueless and worthless has great difficulty giving love. Oh, I'm not talking about infatuation. Those kinds of persons regularly fall into infatuation with someone else. I'm not talking infatuation. I'm talking love. Because you see, love is a gift of worth given by a person of worth. How can I love God? when I wonder if in fact he's not the one to blame for this whole mess. How can I love others? Because 
I'm nobody. I have nothing to give to you. Why? Why is this kind of a sense of worthlessness and valuelessness, why is that so common among us? And the answer, I think, is very, very simple. It is sin. How do you think Adam and Eve felt about themselves as they were walking down that thorny path toward the angels with the flaming swords? Oh, I know what Adam was saying. Oh, oh man, I did a good day's work today. <laughs> Eve was saying, I'm so glad I ate that fruit. That was really a bright thing to do. <laughs> no, they weren't. They were saying, you fool. You idiot. You. You have given away paradise. How could you be so dumb? And of course, they were saying it to each other as well. Yeah, that's what sin does. Sin in both the Old and the New Testament is to miss the target. To sin is to miss the goal of living and of life. It's to draw back the bow and let fly the arrow and watch it curve away. That's sin. And so planted in the human heart. Even when we're not aware of it, is that cry, you've missed it. You've blown it. When I have done everything, I am an unprofitable servant. Sin has put its imprint on the whole human race and every one of us down in the very depths of our soul has that voice saying, you missed it. But on the other side, and closely related, is our imperfection. In response to that inner deep voice saying, you missed it, is another voice which says, but I'm going to do it. I will achieve, I will conquer the pride which is the flip side to sin. The pride which says, I will make it. And the result, of course, is that our sense of failure is even amplified because we don't make it. Few of us ever achieve all that we dream of. And those who achieve it usually find it wasn't worth achieving. It's often enhanced by our parents. On the one hand are the good parents. I can talk. I am one. We want the best for our children. We want them to achieve. We don't want them to fail. We don't want them to fall short. We want them to have all that life can offer. You know how it is. I'm teaching my son to high jump. And I set the bar right here about, about three feet high. He's about two feet high. I say, now honey, you can do it. Daddy, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You really can. I believe in you, son. You really can. Now let me show you. You, you take a little hop and you throw your one leg up like this and throw your head and you're over. Try it. Boom. Daddy, I can't do it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Now, here, here's, here's what you did wrong. About five times, the little kid goes for the bar and knocks it down. But the sixth time, he does it. He does it. He's over. I say, man, that's great. That's tremendous. I knew you could do it. You're a chip off the old box, son. You can really make it. You're great. Now I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to raise the bar six inches. Daddy. What have I said to my child? Out of my love. Out of my desire to teach him. I've said five times out of six, you're going to fail. Now you say, Oswald, do you believe in setting low standards for the kids? No, I don't. I'm just talking about this human predicament in which we are. And I am suggesting with one finger to you and three to myself that we've got to find additional ways 
of saying to that kid, you're worth something even more than your achievements. And then, of course, there are the bad parents. Those of us who were in the missionary service yesterday afternoon heard a terrifying example of that. You're not worth anything. You're no good. You might as well not try. You'll fail. We both know that. You're not worth my time. May I, a lot of you are grandparents and, and so us old folks can talk together, but some of you are younger. And this is real dangerous. I, I'm glad we're getting toward the weekend here and I only have two more times to speak before I can run for it. I, I hope you love me. <laughs> And I know we're in a recession. <laughs> and I know. But when we send our children to the daycare, we tell them loud and clear, you are not worth mommy's time. Karen, my wife, has talked to me at some length on this subject. She said, she's a librarian and a teacher, she said, do you know why our children are increasingly uncontrollable? I said, no. She said, because we're getting the first generation now of the daycare children. Well, the daycare people, they're doing daycare because they can't do anything else in many cases. Face it, friends. They're not going to control the children. And when mom and dad come home at night, they're tired. They don't have enough energy left to deal with these little so-and-sos who are going to test you every inch of the way. So the child says, I'm not worth anything. I'm not worth my daddy's time. I'm not worth my mommy's time. They know, they understand. Now you say, oh, well, you're trying to make all of us young mothers who are, who are working for, for a career and meaning you're, you're trying to make us guilty. No, I'm not. I'm just saying, let's not sacrifice our children on the altar of a scale of living to which we wish to become accustomed. In one of Dobson's films, he says, I know you're listening. I just heard the person on the back row breathe. Where does this sense of worthlessness come from? It comes from a world of sin in which the voice inside cries out to me, you have failed, you have missed the mark. It comes from a world in which the pride of perfection drives me to higher levels for me and my children and fails. Now, what's the wrong way to deal with this? Well, there's the world's way. Make yourself and your desires central, baby. Nobody else is going to take care of you. Nobody else is going to think about you. If you're to get what's yours, you've got to go take it. That's exactly what the boy in our story thought. Man, all these years I've been slaving on this stupid farm, breaking my back for what? A pile of soybeans. Forget that, man. I'm going to have it my way. I'm going to find myself And I'll cut every tie I've got to find myself. And off he went. Protect yourself at all costs. Do not give yourself away. Stop being a giver. Start being a taker. You can find that in Cosmopolitan. You can find that in Esquire. You can find that in GQ. 
You can find that on the tube. You can find it every place you look. Stop being a giver. Start being a taker if you want to be worth something. Do your thing and devil take the hindmost. That's the way to get rid of these feelings of inferiority. That's the way to get rid of these feelings of worthlessness. That's what the Bible calls self-love and condemns from start to finish. Because you see, the Bible doesn't condemn stuff because it works, but the Bible doesn't like it. The Bible condemns stuff because it doesn't work. What does self-love lead to? It only leads to greater separation. It only leads to cutting ourselves off from everything and everyone who give us meaning in our lives. And the end result <laughs> yeah, we're friends to the end and you've just run out of money and this is the end. He's in the pig pen, isn't he? He cut himself off from everybody who really cared about him. <coughs> he set himself up to be rootless. He set himself up My second son is 20 years old and he's uh, <clears throat> having a little difficulty with uh, mom and dad's values. He's living in Columbus, Ohio this summer, working at the college where he attends. I'll not bore you with the details of the story, but he got beat up a week ago. And the lower front teeth were knocked loose and he called us and so uh, mom and dad went up the next day and picked him up and brought him home and took him to our family dentist to see if we can save the teeth it was very interesting to see or to hear Andrew say to us You know, it's nice to have a mom and a dad who are together. He said, I was thinking as I was walking home, spitting out blood, I'm going to call mom and dad. He said, it's nice to know, no matter how old you are, you can still call mom and dad. I was very proud of myself. I bit my tongue. I said, that's nice. <laughs> Cut yourself off. Cut off everything that gives you meaning and roots and value. And build yourself up. Love yourself and you'll find yourself. No, you will not. You'll lose yourself. Like that kid sitting in the pig pen saying, What's going on here? Where have all my dreams gone? Where have all my hopes gone? They're over. We were talking at the breakfast table about a person whom we know the Harrises and I. Tragic, tragic story of a man who destroyed his life and deeply injured the lives of many around him for these very kinds of reasons. The Bible doesn't condemn it because it thinks it's a great idea and people will find it works and go away from God. The Bible condemns it because it doesn't work. So how do you do it? How do you find worth and significance and value for yourself? Well, there's another wrong way. And unfortunately, it's a wrong way which the church has often espoused. This is a perversion of Scripture. The world says, project yourself. This way says, extinguish yourself. Destroy your identity, your character, your nature. Die to yourself. Make yourself nothing. 
Now you say, hold it, Oswald. Doesn't the Bible say die to yourself? It certainly does. Doesn't the Bible say be crucified with Christ? Yes. But what the Bible is talking about is self-will. And we need to be very clear in our distinction here. God doesn't want to destroy your personality. He made it. He loves it. And I want to say something more about that in a moment. God doesn't want to destroy yourself in the sense of your personality. What He wants to destroy is your self-will that says, I'll do what I want, when I want, where I want. But that's not you, friends. That's not you. That's a cancerous growth on your personhood. And God, like a great surgeon, hates it and wants to kill it with everything he's got. But he doesn't want to kill you in the process. And all too often, the church has missed that important distinction and has suggested to us, just extinguish yourself. Just get rid of all that makes you you and then you'll find worth. Well, I don't see how a nothing can be worth much. But that's exactly the route that the boy in the pig pen decided to take. Man, what a dummy. What a stupid idiot. My father's slaves have three square meals a day and I'm here eating pea pods. This is nuts. And so he made up his little speech. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Got that right. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me a slave. Beat yourself. Discipline yourself. Whip yourself. Make yourself good enough to lick God's feet and it'll be okay. Oh, and our enemy stands right beside us handing us a fresh whip when we wear out the other one. I'm no good. I'm a wretch. I'm worthless. And the devil says, that's right, hit it again. But it won't work. I'm very interested at Paul's statement in the book of Colossians. He says, I know people who really do devotions, who are really into rigorous worship. I know people who are really deeply into self-abasement. That's a real basement, self-abasement. Well, never mind. Uh, (laughs) And he says, but it will not control the passions. And we have proved that 20 different ways from Sunday in the last 30 years. I'll make myself good enough for God. I'll make myself good enough for God. I'll make myself good enough for God. I'll extinguish myself. I'll push myself down. I'll wipe myself out. And along comes a pretty little 18-year-old girl looking for a daddy. (laughs) I think she thinks (laughs) I am virile and manly and young. She thinks I look like a daddy. Bald and pot-bellied and bifocals and miscommunication is what that's called. It won't work. It won't control the passions. If my relationship to God is a slave relationship to God, when the temptation comes, the passions will break out. The world's way, project yourself. And forget everybody else. This way of the church, extinguish yourself. Destroy yourself. Make yourself a slave. So what's the right way to find worth and value in our lives? Four words. 
Now, E. Stanley Jones said one time, people accuse me of having only one string on my guitar, five strings. Surrender, 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 and surrender. That's the number one word. Surrender to the love of God. Now, some of you can remember teenage years. Maybe most of you. My dad, who's 97, says, I don't feel any different than I did when I was 18. <laughs> I'll, take it, I'll take it as read. But do you remember the day when somebody said to you, I love you? Whoo! That was rather interesting. That was kind of fun. That was nice. But did you feel loved? No. Because you weren't returning it. You weren't surrendering to it. You were t 